commercial photographers aren't just creating commercial photography, they are creating commercial propaganda. And they're using images that are filtered exclusively through the male perspective, the male gaze, male mind, and that reflect the male experience. In a way, in a big way, sexism in photography is playing a lead role in perpetuating sexism in our culture. What's up guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I have part three of my three-part series on sexism in photography. So my previous videos in this series, I talked about model harassment and the way that models are treated and photographer harassment. From my own experience, it was kind of a fun story time. So if you haven't seen those videos, go and check them out. But today's video is going to be a bit different than those. Those were very specific uh, categories of sexism. And in today's video, I just wanted to talk about sexism in the industry in general. Uh, sexist hiring practices, ca commercial decisions, advertising decisions, and the cultural impact that those decisions have. I'm going to make the argument and defend the argument that sexism in photography actually plays a leading role in perpetuating sexism in our broader culture. And then I have an interview with a fellow female photographer. She lives down in the States. Her name is Erica Lamoth. And we're just going to be talking generally about a lot of the topics that I'm covering in this video. So I'm leaving it towards the end because our conversation does kind of encompass a lot <laughs> of what I have to say. It didn't really fit in any one section. So that's at the end. So I did work really hard on this video uh, before I begin. If you just, if you want to give it a like, if you enjoy it, or if you want to subscribe to my channel, or even just leave a comment letting me know what you think, that would be amazing. It really helps me out and it really encourage me to put this kind of effort into future videos. I'm sorry this intro is so long, but I do have three quick disclaimers before I get into it. So first, I use a lot of men and women type language in this video, and I'm not meaning to be exclusive to non-binary photographers, non-binary creators, and viewers. If you are non-binary yourself and you would like to weigh in on this topic, please leave a comment because I'd be actually really, really interested to see how the non-binary perspective fits into this highly gendered landscape of uh, commercial photography particularly. But I had a really hard time when I was doing research finding uh, a lot of information coming from non-binary voices and sources, so I apologize for that and I just wanted to acknowledge that this is a very men and women-y video and I would just love to address um, gender nonconformity in photography in the future. Another disclaimer is that I talk a lot about the male gaze in this video. And uh, if you don't know what that means, go off and, and look it up because I'm not going to bother doing a full deep dive into what it is. Um, but put simply, I'm not criticizing men as individuals. Rather, I am criticizing the institution of men um, and how patriarchal values and perspectives really dominate the photography industry. So if you're the kind of man who can't handle criticism of the institution of men and, uh, and maleness in general, then this video probably isn't for you. Finally, in this video, I don't talk about the intersection between race and gender. I absolutely understand that oppression is intersectional, but in this video, I'm going to be focusing on just one axis of oppression, and that is gender. The reason for that is that I plan in the near future to do a whole other video on racism in photography. And that's going to be in the near future. So I just wanted to make this disclaimer. If you see that I'm really not mentioning uh, race or intersectionality at all, uh, that's why. Because there's going to be a dedicated video coming in the near future on that topic. But do keep in mind while you're watching this video that factors like race and socioeconomic class play huge roles in a photographer's ability to make it in the market and in their experience in the market and in the kind of images that are broadcast to our society. So we'll talk about that in the future. Right now we're just talking about gender as one axis of oppression. One more thing I want to mention is that this video is scripted because I wanted to get absolutely every piece of information right and out there. So I'm just going to be kind of glancing down occasionally because my script is right underneath the camera. Okay, <laughs> so without further ado, let's just do a little exercise to begin. Just wade right in. So, <laughs> Google influential photographers. I don't know what you get, but I've Googled this on uh, incognito mode and just on my regular browser mode. So, the first result that I get is 49 most influential photographers in history. And it's a list. And it has six women on it. The next item is a list of 25 famous photographers in history with two women on it. Then we've got... 27 most famous photographers with five women on it. And Annie Leibovitz is on every single list. <laughs> so it's not like there's a whole bunch of different women being represented on these lists. It's like the same five women over and over. And Annie Leibovitz is literally like on every single one. So let's Google uh, famous street photographers. <laughs> we've got the first one is a 20 person list with five women. And then we've got 31 contemporary street photographers with eight women. 
And then we've got 10 famous street photographers you should know with three women. What about uh, famous fashion photographers? Let's Google that. All right, well, I get 10 iconic fashion photographers and there's only one woman. Guess who it is? It's Annie Leibovitz. The next one is five most iconic fashion photographers with uh, Annie Leibovitz is the only woman. We've got 11 famous fashion photographers in 2020 and it's got three women, including Annie Leibovitz. <laughs> and we've got fashion photographers who made history with 10 men and no women, not even Annie. Annie has not made history apparently, even though she's evidently the only influential female photographer ever. So an industry, fashion, that has historically been strongly associated with women. And I understand that recently there has been an amazing cultural boom for men's fashion, and that is awesome, but you have to admit that historically, people think women and fashion kind of go together. And even that industry is dominated by male photographers. So obviously there's an issue here, right? The way that we document women's accomplishments or celebrate female photographers is clearly significantly lacking, but it goes a lot deeper than that. It's not just how we record or recognize female photographers. I'll give you some statistics if you're, just, if you're ready to get angry, because I'm, I'm already angry. Uh, women make up about 70 to 80% of students in photography arts related programs in college and university but only 13 to 15% of professional photographers are women. A further 92% of commercial advertisements are shot by men, and 85% of magazine covers are shot by men. So women are the majority, like the vast majority of people studying photography, and yet men are the vast majority of photographers who are able to make a living at the art. What is stopping women from going pro? Is the female gaze just not good at selling stuff? So women, actually make 70 to 80 percent of consumer purchasing decisions. So 70 to 80 percent of everything that's bought is bought by women. And uh, 91 percent of women in one study said that they don't think that advertisers understand them. Jeez, I wonder why that would be. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say it's because the male gaze is heavily reflected in the kinds of imagery that's used to sell us things. Like heavily reflected. For example, um, dismembered women on advertisements. So <laughs> ladies, have you ever seen a, just a woman's leg, like her, her naked hairless leg, and that's selling you a razor or something? Or, <laughs> you know, a woman's booty and just her dismembered torso selling you underwear? Because I see those advertisements all the time and no, they don't appeal to me. I don't like seeing dismembered pieces of other women's bodies. It doesn't make me want to buy a razor. Do you go to a shopping center and you're like, wow, I love shopping because I get to be bombarded by imagery of the dismembered torsos of women that men find sexually attractive. Okay, editing Yvonne here, and I'm just watching this clip and I realize that there's actually one more thing that I want to say about it. But a lot of advertisers have figured out that dismembering women is like not necessarily the best way to sell your product. But they haven't figured out that hiring a female photographer is the best way to sell your product if you're trying to sell it to women. So they will have like a full woman, like, you know, her whole body with her head, miraculously. But she'll still be like an over-sexualized caricature, angelically posed in this very like, you know, coy and inviting body language. And that still isn't working for me. Like, that's still not selling me stuff. I can't see myself in those ads. Therefore, I can't see myself using the product in the way that it's depicted. I just think it makes a lot more sense to have the ad photographed by a woman who has used that product, or at least, you know, products like it, knows what she's looking for in the product, and then therefore knows how to display the product to make it desirable, to really highlight those qualities that she likes about the product. Like a man who's never worn women's jeans or who's never like shaved his legs, why is he photographing for these products? I just, I just don't get it. From a business perspective, like purely business, no social justice involved, I'm just like a heartless CEO trying to make the best decision to sell my product. It makes the most sense to hire a female photographer because she knows how to capture this image in a way that is going to be appealing to women. Like that just makes sense. So why didn't they have a female photographer? Why didn't they have a female marketing director? Why are women not being hired into these roles where they would be best poised to sell things to other women? Well, uh, <laughs> reading a lot of internet commentary on it, which don't do that, it's bad for your mental health. But uh, we've got some common cited reasons. So women are just not as ambitious or career oriented as men, obviously, right? The home life of women takes precedent over their careers. You know, we all just want to get pregnant and have kids and like, who needs a career when you have a baby? <laughs> uh, women are happier in smaller supporting roles. You know, we don't need to be the center of attention, the person directing all these models and this creative team. No, we're happy just shooting weddings, a second shooter and, and maternity shoots. <laughs>
Or maybe women are higher maintenance than men, so, you know, it's just easier to hire a male photographer because the woman's going to be, like, on her period or something. Like, it's such bullshit. But these are actually, like, the excuses that I've heard from real people. And, I mean, you can say that those people are just anecdotes, and sure they are, but I think it is definitely symptomatic or at least indicative of the underlying current. Here are some other reasons that I've heard is that, you know, a lot of men in the industry just feel more comfortable around other men. And, like, let's unpack that, shall we? So, is it, are they worried that their wives are gonna get jealous if they're hanging around a female photographer? They have this fear that the female photographer could ruin their career with sexual assault allegations because that happens so often that a woman is willing to just give up her entire life and all of her credibility to make false accusations against a random man for no apparent reason. Like, oh yeah, that must happen all the time. That doesn't happen. Stop saying that it happens. Maybe the men just feel like they're walking on eggshells around female professionals. Maybe they just find it hard to develop a professional rapport with a female photographer. Maybe it's just difficult to connect because they come from such different worlds. And, y you know, the common thread with all of these things is that literally none of that is the woman's fault. Like, literally none of those are things that the woman is actually doing, right? Those are all the men's perception of the woman. But they still impact female photographers' career possibilities and advancement in the industry. Editing Yvonne here, I'm back. So I know a lot of the things that I'm saying here, you know, if you are a genuine, nice, like, you know, social justice conscious dude and and you don't hang out with guys like this it could you know this can sound like almost exaggerated and i just really want to stress that this is not exaggerated and like you know i have worked with a lot of men who are not like this obviously i'm not saying this about all men <laughs> obviously 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 but the the people who are higher up in these creative spaces oftentimes have these old-timey attitudes and a lot of the times you know a man who's gotten to that point in his career is older and so he's part of a generation when it was appropriate to think of women like this. Like, I'm realizing that the way that I'm speaking in this video is coming across as though I think all of these are conscious decisions being made with malicious intentions by the men in power, and I'm sure a few of them are, but I think the majority of it is unconscious decisions. You know, um, you know, maybe a man's like, I, I cheated on my wife last year and she doesn't trust it when I hang around other women so I'm gonna hire a man into this role. I think in a lot of cases it's just a man thinking, you know, it would just be easier to hire a man this time and maybe I'll hire a woman next time and maybe he doesn't really understand why but these assumptions are going on like underneath the surface at an unconscious level and he just hasn't had the motivation or even the knowledge of them enough to interrogate those those assumptions and kind of tackle them. And uh, that's that's really the root of it. Like a lot of sexism, just like racism, is really unconscious and needs to be interrogated in order to even be noticed by the person who holds those those prejudiced beliefs. It's really hard for female photographers to break into an industry where those perceptions are still very much alive and well. And the fewer female photographers who are able to break into that industry, the less exposure the men in that industry have to what female photographers are actually like, or what women in general are actually like. Because I honestly feel like there's a lot of myths that develop in these all-male circles about who women are and what women are like. And they're usually just that, just myths. You know, it's 2021, we have a lot of other industries that are really making an effort to include women and women's voices more often. So what's going on with photography? Well, the people who are hiring photographers are all men is basically my the crux of my argument. We've got 89% of creative directors are men. We've got 83% of chief marketing officers who are men. <laughs> We've got 60% of small business owners who are men. And men are also in the positions of power to help promote other men in the industry. So, you know, it's already male dominated and all those men are promoting other men. <clears throat> We've got Nikon, for example. They picked 32 photographers to help promote a camera and all of those photographers were men. But that's not surprising because Nikon's entire board of directors is also all men. Sony is not much better. Sony's got four women on their board of directors out of 29 people. However, a quick shout out to the Sony World Photography Awards. I don't actually think it's anything to do with Sony. I think Sony probably just bought it. But their board of directors is like almost all women, which was very refreshing to see when I was doing the research for this video. So far, I've just been talking about traditional media, like commercials and camera companies, but it's also super prevalent on social media. So I, I watched one video by a female photographer that I'll put a little screen grab of it here and I'll also link it down in the description. But she was talking about a popular, she didn't name names, but popular male photographer who gave a list of like awesome photographers to go and follow right now and all of them were men. <laughs> And I take it that this happens quite often because I've watched a lot of videos, even with some of my favorite street photographers. Like, you know, they're great guys, they make great content, and they collaborate almost exclusively with other men. So those smaller channels who they're collaborating with 
are the ones who are getting the promotion, and they're all men as well. And there are some really amazing creators who are making a super, super concerted effort to include more female voices and more racialized voices, and that is amazing, and I really want to acknowledge that that is happening, but there are still so many creators who just are not even thinking about it. Like, it's not that they don't think it's a problem, but they just it doesn't even cross their minds that, hey, actually, I'm shouting out this list of 10 photographers and all of them are men. That doesn't even cross their minds when they're doing it. And that's part of the problem. And it's also really hard to find female creators who are talking about their experiences with this, because honestly, talking about sexism in the industry can actually jeopardize your chances of getting in with the industry. Like, there's this perception that as a female photographer, you have to kind of be one of the guys, like one of the boys, in order to make it. And when you call out sexism, it, it others you. It others you from your peers, and that's really shitty. One of the things that really stood out to me when I was watching interviews with Annie Leibovitz and the people who she had shot with, there was, uh, I think, the lead singer of the Rolling Stones. Is it Mick Jagger? I think it's Mick Jagger. <laughs> and he was saying, you know, when she came on tour with them, uh, the reason why she was able to get such good photos of them is because she was able to just be one of the guys, you know? She was down there doing everything with us. I hated that interview because Annie Leibovitz is like the female photographer who's on all of these lists. And here she is acting like one of the guys, right? And she has to do that in order to get this level of fame. It drives me crazy. So Annie Leibovitz got famous photographing musicians, and I actually did find a really good YouTube video by a concert photographer. Uh, she's a woman who also photographs musicians, and she was talking about how she started on YouTube because she saw so few other photographers who were women talking about concert photography. You should also go and just check out her video, I'll link it down in the description, because it was really, really interesting. And she interviewed some other female concert photographers and she talked a little bit about her own experiences. She also makes a really good point that it's all male photographers who are touring with the bands, right? And so you see a bunch of female photographers down in the pit trying to get pictures, but when it comes to who's on tour, it's all men. Which I think is just another really interesting example of how it's not for lack of trying. Like, you know, it's not that women aren't interested in this industry, it's that there are barriers that are preventing women from excelling in this industry. She also read some statements from other female concert photographers who had answered like a survey that she had done. And uh, one of them said that when you're, you know, you're showing up at a gig and there's a bunch of photographers and maybe you're like only one or like one of a few women. And so you kind of feel like you're competing with these women for that slot, right? Like if there's only one slot available to a woman and 10 available to a man, then you're competing with other women to be the woman photographer. And that's such a scam. <laughs> like it's such a scam. The fact that there is such a small place for us in the industry and that when there's more than one of us in a room, then there's like this weird incentive to be adversarial. And so we don't get the same chance as men to develop those healthy friendships and like professional relationships that will help us both mutually propel our careers. So that's something that I am like super, super trying to reject. Like every female photographer I run into on the street, I am like networking, right? Like, cause that's the way that we're gonna get ahead is like a united front <laughs> of female photographers saying, hey, like, we're done, we've had enough, we are just as much creative professionals as these guys. But you know, that said, like I can't blame women for having those adversarial relationships with other women. I blame the system that sets them up and, and puts them in that scam. Oh yeah, this YouTuber's name is Boston Schultz, by the way, I realized that I didn't mention that. So Boston Schultz, a few of the other interviewees in her video uh, said that they feel like they're being treated like a woman first and a photographer second. So a lot of the time they'll get invited backstage to like hang out with the crew or hang out with the band and uh, always, without fail, get unwanted sexual advances that can get increasingly aggressive. And it's very clear to them that they're not invited back there to photograph the band, they're invited back there to be an attractive woman for the band. Okay, so we get it, right? Like, women are underrepresented in this industry, it's really hard for women to get ahead in this industry, and the majority of the images that we see in our daily lives are being lensed by men. So <laughs> men hiring men, and men promoting men, and men networking with men, and that hurts female photographers like myself. But what other impact does it have? Now my argument is that it actually has a really deep and really insidious cultural impact. It's not just the individual female photographer who's having a hard time in her career, it is the culture, our culture, our highly visual culture, that is being shaped entirely by images filtered through the male gaze. Now, Jill Greenberg is a really, really influential photographer, very accomplished, very famous. She's got some amazing work. I'll put it up here while I'm talking about her. But she gives a, oh no, my light died. My blue light died, sorry guys, we're purple for the rest of the show. But anyway, very influential photographer. I'm gonna put some photos here while I'm talking about her. 
But she's famous for these images of babies crying, and she developed in the series this lighting technique that you can tell is very unique and very individual to her own personal style. But she realized that she might have hit the glass ceiling when she started noticing that men were getting hired into gigs where the client wanted photos that were captured with this particular lighting style. Now isn't that odd because it's her look. It is the Jill Greenberg look. There are literally university classes that teach the Jill Greenberg look and here are men who aren't Jill Greenberg getting hired to replicate her look. So what gives? She asked some of her friends in the industry and they said, oh well that magazine or that TV news network, that's a boys club which means that they only hire men. And these are popular magazines, these are popular TV networks, you know? They are very much prominent in our culture, they are shaping our culture, and they are boys clubs, they only hire men. So we see women in forward-facing roles, we see women on the cover of magazines and women taking the lead in TV shows, and then there's an irony, and Jill Greenberg points this out in her TED Talk, the irony that these influential women are being lensed entirely by men. Just think about how ironic it is that somebody like AOC or Oprah or Greta Thunberg, they are all getting photographed exclusively by men. So the images that we see of them are only what a man thought we would want to see. The way that influential women are being introduced to our culture are being displayed, the, the visual narrative that we are being given that tells us who they are, that is all being lensed by men. A great example is the controversial Vogue cover of Kamala Harris. Now, I don't agree with Kamala Harris's political stance. I think she's a neoliberal pro-incarceracionist, but that is not relevant to her gender. That is just her politics. But she showed up on the cover of Vogue, and look at this picture that they've selected of her. This was photographed by a man, and she's wearing street clothes. She's standing in front of the colors of her sorority, so it's basically reducing her to a student, calling back to when she was a student. And then she's got this look on her face, like she's not even ready for them to take the picture. Like she's like, okay, I guess we're doing this kind of thing. And you can see that on her face, right? But for some reason, this image was the one that made the cover of Vogue. And even this alternate version of the cover, she's standing in this really like uncomfortable position that it looks like she's kind of hugging herself. Like I think maybe they were going for like a power pose, but they didn't hit the mark. I don't know, I, I got a lot of problems with the way that women are displayed on magazine covers and I'm pretty sure that almost all of those problems come from the fact that women are photographed exclusively by men. And this was the version of the cover that Vogue was criticized for not choosing. You know, neither image is great, neither image is particularly empowering, and in both images she's photoshopped to look about 15 years younger, but that is an issue that I'm going to talk about a little later on in the video. That is just one example, and it might not even be the best example, but it's just the most recent one, and it's the one that I literally had on hand. But anyway, back to Jill Greenberg's TED Talk, she reminds the audience that it's actually not just the way that the photo is taken that is determined by the photographer. You know, oftentimes photographers have a say in the casting, in the hair and makeup, the styling, the backdrop, the posing, lighting, all of it. And she also reminds us that commercial photographers aren't just creating commercial photography, they are creating commercial propaganda. And that propaganda shapes our desires, our insecurities, our goals and motivations and perceptions of the world around us, and it's propaganda funded by the wealthiest, most insidious industries in the world, and an unimaginable amount of time, energy, money, resources is going into finding the perfect way to drill that propaganda into our heads. And they're using images that are filtered exclusively through the male perspective, the male gaze, male mind, and that reflect the male experience. So the way that we are being shown the world, our perception of the world, is coming from men. And, you know, in a way, in a big way, sexism in photography is playing a lead role in perpetuating sexism in our culture. That's, that's really the crux of what I'm saying. It isn't necessarily the root of all evil, but it is at the root of the problem for sure. As long as we have a problem with the way that women are depicted, we are going to have a problem with the way that we see women, right? As long as the female perspective is visually missing from our highly visual culture, we're gonna have a problem with the way we see women. <laughs> if we want to tackle sexism in society, we really need to pay a lot of attention to sexism in the photography industry and the role that that is playing in the images, the, the kaleidoscope of images that we are bombarded with on a daily basis. That is something that we absolutely need to address, and we need to do that sooner rather than later. 
And these corporations, these advertisers, are doing a great job of making it look like they care. They're featuring influential women on their magazine covers, but they're not hiring female photographers or female creative directors or female creative teams. And so the images, even though they are of women, are still male-dominated images. Does that make sense? They are still displaying a male narrative about how the world works and about how women fit into that world. Okay, so Jean Kilborn has a TED talk on the way that advertisements see and depict women. And she has been collecting advertisements since the late 1960s. And she may have actually been one of the first people to actually document uh, the way that advertisements see women, or at least women's role in advertising. She says that advertisements used to be overtly sexist. And I mean, I know that all of us have kind of seen like, oh my God, egregious advertisements in the 60s telling women that they need to vacuum the house before their husband gets home or they'll wind up in divorce or something, right? Like we've seen those advertisements, we know what they look like. But, <laughs> you know, modern advertisements still have all of the same visual imagery. They just don't have the overtly sexist language. So, you know, you take out, you have an image of somebody shaving their armpit and you take out the bit that's like, oh, men hate hairy armpits because it makes you look like an animal. But they still keep in the imagery that implies you want this, this will make you desirable to men. So the advertisements are still telling the same story, but without the overt sexist language. They're doing it in a more insidious way. Now, Jean's TED Talk is predominantly concerned with advertising throughout the ages, and I would definitely encourage you to watch it because she's got some really great examples of just like the shitty treatment of women in advertising. But her more modern takes are kind of towards the middle and the end of the TED Talk, where she talks about Photoshop and the disparities between how it is applied to men and women in advertising. So she's got this image that compares Brad Pitt with former supermodel Lisa Evangelista. Now both of these people are known for being attractive and have always been attractive. <laughs> they're both in their late 40s and they're both in an ad for Chanel. Now Brad Pitt in this image looks like a 49 year old man, right? He looks wise and experienced and distinguished. Whereas Lisa Evangelista is retouched into the uncanny valley. She is cartoonish. What this shows you is that a man in an advertisement has the privilege of aging, the privilege of looking distinguished and experienced. You know, you would never retouch Brad Pitt to look 22 because that would be super weird. Like that would be super weird. But women must stay young because that is what is most sexually appealing to the patriarchy. Like, women don't have the privilege of looking wise and experienced in commercial photography. They don't have the privilege of aging or of showing evidence of the years of experience that they have lived. Showing a woman's age would be showing her value as something beyond a sex object, right? You're showing the value that she has as an experienced professional who has spent maybe 30 years in the industry. When you Photoshop that out, you're taking that away from her. Right? You're making her look like she's just new into the industry, a fresh face. And that is such a horrible thing to do to somebody, especially without their consent. And a lot of the times, women who pose for these advertisements don't know that they're going to be photoshopped like this. They don't know that they're going to come out the other side 30 years younger, missing 30 years of their professional experience from the way that they're depicted in those advertisements. You know, like if I have 30 years experience in the industry, I don't want someone else to make the decision to make it look like I'm 22, like I just graduated college. Like that is just so insulting. But it really shows you how value is assigned to men and women. So you know, men are valued for being distinguished and having lived through a lot of great experiences, whereas women just aren't. And that really shows up in the way that women are photographed and in the images that we are shown of women. The male gaze in this case is not only imposing youth on her, not only stripping her of her lived experiences, basically, or of the evidence of her lived experiences, but it is making the implicit assumption that the best way to capture this woman's image, her visage, is by making her look sexually appealing. Because, because that's her selling point. Not that she's famous, not that she's talented or professional, but that she's sexy. Extreme thinness is another example of the male gaze in commercial photography. I stand by it, I've said it before and I'll say it again, if the fashion industry was entirely dominated by women, the models would not be expected to be a size zero to two. Like there's just no way because women understand, especially older women, know that you know you can't stay at this childlike proportion and live a healthy lifestyle, at least not the vast majority of women. Some women can, for sure, genetics, whatever. But the vast majority of women 
cannot do that and stay healthy. And so this industry is prioritizing women's appearances over their health. And I mean, that's obvious and that's a whole other video topic. There have been tons of topics about the horrible, horrible, horrible beauty standards that models are held to or thinness standards. I don't even wanna call them beauty standards. But why is that? Oh, well, it's because extreme thinness mimics youthful proportions, like childlike proportions. And that is what the patriarchy finds most sexually appealing, is youth. And a male photographer, a male fashion photographer might not even think about that, to be honest with you. And me as a female fashion photographer, like, I get a little bit sick to my stomach seeing images of women who are so deadly thin. Because I know, like, what they must be going through to maintain that. Like, if you had more women photographers, as part of these beauty campaigns and in having input from the beginning, more women creative directors, right? You wouldn't have models who feel the need to adhere to that kind of standard because I would be selecting women who look like healthy, happy women because that is what is gonna sell things to other women. And I know that body image and all of that in media is definitely a whole other topic, but I really wanted to mention it in this video because for photography and photography conventions absolutely perpetuate this really, really sick, honestly, this sick standard that models are held to. It's, it's perpetuated by photographers, by others, but by photographers as well. So towards the end of her TED talk, Jean makes a few more points. She points out the trend of dismembering women in advertisements, and that's something that I talked about before. She also points out that being bombarded by this kind of imagery impacts women in how we feel about our own appearances, but it also impacts men and how they feel about the very real women in their lives. And then she also goes into something really interesting that I haven't really gotten into yet, but it's the body language of women and girls in commercial photography. So the body language is very often passive, innocent, and inviting, right? It, it is you know, arched backs, sprawled across beds, open postures, things like that. Things that really invite the male gaze to view the woman as, as an object of pleasure and not actually as a person. And you know, I know there's been so much said about how women are objectified in photography, but I really just wanna point out that a lot of the decision-making is male photographers making those decisions. So a lot of the reason why women are objectified in advertisements and in, in media is because male photographers are being hired for these campaigns and are making these decisions to benefit a male audience. <sighs> so that was a lot. <laughs> I've just got one more bit that I wanna say before we jump into the video. Thank you guys for sticking with me through all of this. I know we've covered a lot of different topics, but like I said, this is such a multifaceted issue and there's, I, there's so much that I'm not even getting into in this video, but you know, stay tuned. I might get into it in future videos. But the last bit that I wanna cover is photojournalism. So we've talked a lot about advertising and commercials and media and all of that, but we haven't really talked about news, right? And so I just wanna remind you guys that like, Commercial advertising is not the only utility of photography. Photography isn't just used to sell you things. It's also used to document events and times and experiences, places, people, right? It's a documentary art, first and foremost. And it helps us learn about what's going on in the world through photojournalism. So how many times have you seen pictures from a protest, like a Black Lives Matter protest or something, and you see like a, a slideshow of images from that? or you see a slideshow of images from a war zone, or you know anything, anything of consequence that goes on in our world shows up in that kind of slideshow reel of images that we are so accustomed to seeing on news websites and in newspapers. So 80% of photojournalists are men, which means that around 80% of the press photos that we consume are taken by men. Honestly, it's kind of frightening <laughs> to me to think that the way that we see news events the way that we are shown what is going on in the world around us is coming from an almost entirely male perspective. What, Im what information are we missing on the edges of the image? And it makes me think of this little political cartoon, right? Like, what are we not being shown? Every single photographer authors the photos that they take, you know? There's no such thing as purely documentary photography. You cannot do it. You cannot just purely document an event. Your perspective as a photographer uh, will leak into your photos no matter what. So, so what scares me <laughs> is that we don't know, you know? We don't know how much or in what ways the male perspective is leaking into the photos that document events, uh, that document news, and that eventually form history. 
You know, we're completely blind to it. And so historical photographs, we don't know, we'll never know what we weren't able to see because these historical photographs were taken entirely by men. Like, like what amazing women will we never know about? What amazing scenes will we never see? What narratives are glorified in press photography and which are ignored? We just, we just don't know. Editing Yvonne here. I feel like I should make it really clear, like, I'm not saying that the male perspective isn't valuable. It is, but it's only one part of the puzzle. So I think about it as, like, triangulation. To have multiple perspectives is to be able to triangulate the truth of what actually happened. You know, if it was only the female perspective being shown in media, we would have a, a very different media landscape, but it still wouldn't be giving us the entire truth, or at least it wouldn't be giving us the most accurate picture possible. I believe, honestly, that if we want to get the most accurate picture possible of what's going on at these events and in history and in the world, we need to have a plurality and a diversity of photographic perspectives. So that's people of all different races and genders and classes um, participating in documenting these events. And, you know, thank God that we have that now a little bit more in the modern world that everybody has a camera in their back pocket and their phone, but still the images that get published in newspapers and on formal sources are still being predominantly narrated by men. So sexism in photography sounds like a light topic. Oh my God, female photographers are being oppressed and having a hard time in their careers. But no, sexism in photography literally defines our history. It defines our culture. It goes so much deeper than you would expect if you really think about it. And believe me, I have really thought about it. Okay, so a bit of a tonal shift. Uh, I'm, now that I'm just leaving you with this to stew in it, just think about it, right? Um, I'm going to show you the interview that I did with a fellow female photographer. She's from Bellingham, so she's just across the border from me. Her name is Erica Lamoth. She's also trying to make it in the industry and just trying to make her art as, as honestly as she can, you know, speak her truth through her art, which I super respect. So uh, here's the interview, and we're going to talk about a few things that I've touched on in this video. Uh, so please enjoy. All right, so howdy, it's nice to meet you. I have a few questions for you just starting out and then we'll get into like the bulk of our conversation. So my first question is if you'd like to plug your Instagram or any other socials that you have, um, now is definitely the time to do that. Yes, it is nice to meet you virtually. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love for people to follow my photography page, Erica Lamoth Photography on social media. Um, I have a website, ericalamothart.com, very simple. Um, I also have a art page, Normality is Toxic. It's awesome. And I'll definitely link those down below in the description for anybody watching this on YouTube. Just check it out down there. They'll be there. Um, okay. So my next question is, how long have you been in the industry? And like, what kind of inspires you to get into the industry? I've been taking photos for like seven years. And how I started was I wanted it to be my senior project for high school. Um, and it just, um, it just kind of blossomed into something way more complex than I ever dreamed. I started my project basically doing event photography. So I learned in like the worst possible lighting you could ever learn in. Yeah, like, like learning to drive in a snowstorm. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, it's basically. As hard as it'll get right away. Yeah, and you learn to ad adjust to the light so quickly. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And then um, I tried the wedding thing. I tried, I, I didn't really try the senior portrait thing, but I tried like something similar where I took pictures of people at prom. Um, <laughs> And it just didn't like feel right to me. I wanted to make art. Like I wanted people to be art. I wanted to illustrate humanity. I wanted people to be raw and put themselves in a position they never thought they could put themselves in with photography. I want it to be an experience um, more than just a photo shoot. So um, that's how I like fell in love with photography. Oh my God, I love that so much. So you've been in the industry for quite a while, I guess, or at least taking photos for quite a while. And uh, I'm wondering, like, what kinds of sexism have you experienced yourself or just noticed about the industry? I know I've got a lot of thoughts on this topic, and I'm sure if you've been doing it for seven years, you've probably got a lot as well. Yeah, um, I also pose. Um, it helps me learn. Um, I think if I didn't pose for other photographers, I wouldn't like have the perspective that I do. Um, I think it's really important if you're a photographer, definitely also be a model um, at least a few times just to get a feel for it um, so that you know what it's like to be directed. <laughs> um, yeah, it's important. So I've worked with several male photographers because that's just what happens. There's lots of male photographers and a few of them have like 
touched my face without asking and like I'd hear from other friends later that you know they touched them sexually and I um I I know that there is like I'm I'm based in Seattle so um there is a black list of photographers in existence um you email this email address and they put it on an excel spreadsheet open to the public to view and see um, photographers that you should avoid. Um, this list is very detailed. I won't get into too much, you know, inappropriate touching, lack of consent, um, taking someone else's photos, claiming to be a photographer and taking pictures of women nude and not giving the pictures. Um, just, yeah, it's very, just a whole, there's more. But skin I crawl. My skin is crawling. Like I'm smiling, but my skin is like crawling off of my body. It's so nasty. So what kinds of things have you noticed? Like, cause I'm sure we probably have very similar things that we see on Instagram. Um, but what kinds of like reoccurring trends have you seen on Instagram that really like stand out to you as being part of this male gaze issue? I see a lot of very similar poses and very similar like angles and um even similar lingerie like very specific very tailored um and it just seems fabricated and it seems like a copy of so many things this is not really art anymore you're just literally taking someone else's idea well not even idea anymore just like taking something already like overly saturated and just recreating it to get likes and follows. Like that's what that is. And I know when I see a page with all of that, those similar angles and poses that I'll mention in a second, um, I know that those followers are not really women. Those are all men following. They're following this profile. Do they want to see boobs? They want to see ass. They don't want, they don't care that if, if it's art, they don't, they don't want it to be art. They're just there to like, see the objectification of women and it they don't care what it means they they're just there to, to see them and the poses i'm talking about are like you know you see them they're on a arch bed backs and like yep. yeah poopies on out of bed, like, arch backs they got their feet on the on the bed yeah, feet up frame. The oh i totally know what you mean and yeah and yeah. there's this one photographer i'm not going to name him but um a friend and i are always just kind of like you know shitting on this guy because his his portfolio like his actual photos like the quality of them is really nice the lighting's good the focus is good and then they're all that like cute girls in underwear in these poses on a bed and it's like okay at what point like do you as an artist get bored of this yeah. so how yeah. do you as an artist like how would you strive to kind of combat that in your work well i don't set any expectations for for the first part like when i meet up with women i am like look i don't want to make you uncomfortable um this is how it is with photo shoots at least with me it's you know we're gonna put the we put the outfit together before the shoot we like discuss you know what mood we're going to set we discuss the story we want to tell before the shoot I, especially during the pandemic, I'm like, look, I'm not going to touch you without asking. I'm not, I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to stay a safe distance. And I always ask before, I mean, I, I randomly come up with ideas on the fly sometimes and I'll be like, are you comfortable, you know, laying in the bushes? And they'll be like, no, I don't want to lay in bushes. And I'm like, fine, you know, <laughs> like it would have looked cool, but like, you know, we got to move on. Maybe someone yeah, totally. else will lie in a bush for me. Like, <laughs> totally. I like, shelved that idea. Okay. The next model, I'll ask them. Yeah. Like setting that kind of boundary, like before the shoot actually happens is super, super important. And I'm really glad to hear that you're doing that. Um, I'm also interested to hear, like, how do you think this kind of like representation, not just of the female form, but of like the female place in photography, how do you think that impacts us as female photographers or female creators on platforms like Instagram and our chances of like being noticed or whatever. Yeah. Um, I really feel like when we're trying to be creative, we're just like shoved to the side. I feel like a lot of female photographers are just forced to do weddings, families, babies, puppies, like all of these like you know, just it, we're put in a box. We have to be in this box. We say we're photographers. What do people automatically assume? Oh, do you do weddings and couples and this and that? And I'm like, no, I don't do any of that. 
uh, I take pictures of, I do portraits of people in an artistic form and I tell stories. Um, I'm an artist. It's, it's art. Um, and some people are like, well, there's no money in that. And I'm like, probably not, but <laughs> this is what I do. I make art. And I, I really think that women are shunned from the art part because there's not as much money. Um, and the reason why there isn't as much money is because people are only willing to pay women for these photo shoots, these types of photo shoots. And I really want to stress so bad that like, we don't have to be in this box. Um, it's just a shame. It really is. Um, I saw a post, a blog post from this woman, Stevie Deal. She wrote um, that in 2019, this British Journal of Photography's like Portrait of Humanity Award, um, out of 200 shortlisted artists, 63 of them chosen were women. And it took 20 years to award women. So we're like being published less, being awarded less, discouraged from entering contests. When you think of the traditional, like, you know, OG gender roles, you see art as being in the female category. And yet women who are trying to make money as artists are not being able to make as much money as their male counterparts, despite it being a traditionally quote unquote female role. So, you know, <laughs> you can't even win at, at your own game in some cases. It really feels like there's nothing we can do other than, yeah, just talking about it, bringing attention to it and just being loud about it. So yeah, I'm really thankful you came on today. Um, do you have Me any too. like specific stories that you want to share about kind of how you've experienced this sort of thing? Um, I don't really have any personal stories. I just know from personal feelings, like I've wanted to enter in magazines. I've wanted to put my portfolio out there. I mean, I made a website. I've reached out to, um, I've reached out to local designers. I've reached out to a plenty of photographers who would just say yes or um, sure and then just never get back to me. Like I just feel shoved off all the time and I'm just clawing at these opportunities, trying to make opportunities out of nothing. And um, I end up falling short a lot or I'll try to, to, you know, book shoots. And of course I do a lot of them for no money um, and I get flaked on or you know, um, I'll give the photos and there's just a lack of enthusiasm for them. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe tag me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, at me. Oh my God, please at me. <laughs> that is, that's a whole thing. But <laughs> <laughs> at me, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Getting the credit is getting the ooh. actual credit. Once, once your work is posted, it's like, Hey, uh, I, I took that and edited that and spent a lot of time sorting that. Thanks. I have, I have an FAQ. I made you read. <laughs> yeah. Did you read it? <laughs> Probably not. So what is your like long-term goal in photography? If, if, you know, it was a completely unsexist world and you could just, there was no glass ceiling. What would be the career path that you would envision for yourself? Oh my God. Uh, I really want to publish a book. Um, I really want to publish, get, be published on like, I don't really see myself doing commercial. Um, just too many expectations for retouching. And I just can't like do that to a person. Um, I, I hate like the idea of picking a person apart and like making them look like something else. I can't do it. Um, but I would love to be published. I want to put a book out of like my travel photography. I want to I maybe someday own a studio. Like I really want to be an entrepreneur. That'd be so dope. Like that'd be amazing. I would love that. I And I would love to be an entrepreneur with other women or non-binary photographers like definitely and and lgbtq and like bring the whole freaking head honcho bring it all in i don't know if i said that right but. no i totally i totally agree and like, yeah like that's such a goal is like you know opening a studio and having like you know nine other people who you're sharing it with and they're all like on the same wavelength i'm like that'd be so amazing so hopefully someday we'll get there i would also love to get there one day yeah that'd be nice and to uh get paid to make art instead of, you know, doing the same old, same old poses. Like I can't just do the. Yeah. <laughs> the, the same five things. And it's like, okay, that's yeah. $60. Like, mm -hmm. know. Nope. I can't do the same five things. People got to be open to me doing whatever. Like I don't sell consistency. I sell creativity. I sell like, this is what we're doing with you. It's going to look different from everyone else because it's you. And that's, that's what I sell.
I love that. Yeah, if you want consistency, hire a robot. If you want creativity, hire an artist. And that's exactly, it sounds like what people would be doing if they were to hire you for their portrait shoots or their fashion shoots. So thank you again for taking the time to come on. I really appreciate it. That was a great talk. And uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, I'm back. That was a lovely interview. Go check her out on Instagram, her link's down below. But uh, we talked a lot about in that interview about how repetitive a lot of this imagery is, a lot of this male gaze driven imagery. And, and a lot of it is really obviously male gaze driven, right? Certain poses, she mentioned the same lingerie even crops up again and again. <laughs> and when you scroll through your Instagram feed, like it, it's hard, at least for me, not to notice that, yeah, there's definitely some like very repetitive tropes that I'm honestly just tired of seeing. But it's not just in photography, it's not just on Instagram, you know? This is like a system-wide problem, a culture-wide problem. And we see it again and again in media criticism. So how often, like, like criticism of books, movies, television, just the narratives that were shown, um, we hear the criticism over and over that they're, everything's just a copy of a copy of a copy. And, and how often does it actually happen that something truly original and eye-opening and unique gets put forward into our cultural sphere? It feels like not very often, at least nothing that has a big enough advertising budget to reach a large audience. And I'm gonna argue that the reason for that is that the things that we are seeing, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to argue this, but the images and media that we're being shown is all filtered through one perspective, and that is the male perspective. And the, the, not to mention, the racial element to this is huge, right? Like, it's not just the male perspective, but it's predominantly the white male perspective. So no wonder so much media is just not resonating with audiences, is because it's being filtered ad nauseum through the most privileged eyes on the planet. We're getting the most privileged perspective, and that's all we're being shown. And it, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't match our experiences. It doesn't say anything unique about the culture, right? It's just... It's just media. It's just what we're used to seeing. And the cultural impact of that is not just boring and it's not just repetitive, but it's actively harmful. Women <laughs> inhabit a world where our bodies are dismembered, commodified, stripped of age and agency and identity, hypersexualized, uh, photoshopped into oblivion, and degraded in order to sell us bullshit like face creams and razors. All of this harm is being done to society so that we will buy a razor blade or a shampoo. And it's not just the commercial media landscape. Sexism in photography infiltrates social media. YouTube, Instagram are full of male-led photo shoots. It's honestly everywhere. News media and the way that we document history. It's all male-led, male-guided. So sexism in photography, I'm gonna say this again, I've said it before, is not just a problem for women in the industry. It's not just a problem for female photographers. It is a problem for a society, and it's one that we really, really need to address. I'm not saying that hiring more female photographers alone would solve this problem. It's not going to solve sexism, but it, it really needs to be a bigger part of the conversation because I honestly feel that hiring more female photographers in these leading creative roles would have a huge impact on the way that the world sees women. And you would have, honestly, a hard time convincing me that that is not true. Okay, we are in the final stretch. I have been filming for two hours, but there's just this, this article and I didn't know how to incorporate it into the rest of the video, but I just thought it was like an interesting anecdote. So there's this article called, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met Museum? And it found that 85% of naked paintings, nude paintings, that hung in the modern art section of the Met Museum are of women. But only 5% of the artists are female. So even in painting, we see the female body being commodified and the narrative being crafted entirely by men. Um, I thought that was just a really interesting parallel because, you know, both are motionless visual forms of media and both have almost identical problems. I just thought that was super interesting. Okay, so that was the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you've made it through this whole thing, I, the video's, I don't know yet, but it's probably gonna be around 45 minutes and, you know, I have no regrets because <laughs> I put a lot of time and effort into researching this video. There are not enough female creators on YouTube talking about this issue and I really, really wanted to just do a deep dive. Um, the more I learned, the more I wanted to talk about just every aspect of this. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope you can appreciate how much effort actually went into making this video and talking at a screen for two hours. <laughs> it's the longest video I ever made. Um, 
And if you like this video, don't forget to give me a like and leave a comment letting me know what you think uh, down in the comment section. You know, even if you're leaving a nasty, hateful comment, that's still gonna boost me in the algorithm, so you can go for it. <laughs> Honest, if you watch like a 45 minute video and only to leave a hate comment, there, you know, there's something about you <laughs> that's really unique. But anyway, <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. Um, and if you wanna see more videos like this in the future, if you have topic suggestions or anything, you know, leave those down in the comment section as well. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget to stay sharp and keep shooting. Thank you guys so much for caring enough about my perspective to make it through this entire video. I super appreciate you. Take care. I thought it would be fun for this video about the male gaze to do like the least male gazey makeup look I could possibly do. So this is the result. <laughs>